so I'd also like to add my acknowledgement to traditional owners um, of this land and also to, to add to that an acknowledgement of the work of the custodial um, and technical staff who maintain the facility for us, um, in part because those are groups which are systematically unincluded uh, in these kinds of conversations and I'll, I'll come back to that point. Also to say this is a, in some senses, a work in progress and certainly a reflection back <coughs> on the work I've done in the past and positions I've held in the past, um, as we'll see as we go forward. So we live, when I prepared the slide, um, it was the day before um, the impeachment of the President of Brazil. I was giving a version of this talk in Rio de Janeiro. I wasn't quite expecting to have quite the context we seem to have um, today in the Australian situation, but I think it's fair to say we live in a world which seems to be more divided and more divisive um, than it was in the past. And it wasn't supposed to be this way. The web and the internet were supposed to bring us all together, um, both as civic society members, but also as scholars. This is a similar kind of network um, built of the interactions between um, the scientific literature. Um, we can go back to John Perry's <coughs> Declaration of Independence um, of Cyberspace. The web was supposed to liberate us from the constraints of hierarchies of geography um, to create a world in which we could all communicate effectively together. And that's not really what happened. Um, this is a diagram of voting patterns in the US Congress um, from a paper published in PLOS One in 2015. And what's perhaps most notable about this, and this is a story we see in many parliaments, particularly those with two-party systems, that there's a lot of collaboration between parties right the way through the 20th century, right up until 1993. And then everything seems to go wrong. I mean, that's a, that's a, a very broad brush, simplistic way of putting it. But one of the things that has happened alongside the uptake of the web and the internet has seemed to be a greater polarization of our political discourse, of our civil discourse, and indeed in many ways um, of our research. Um, this doesn't take long to dig into complaints. This is all the fault of social media. Um, the thing that was supposed to bring us together um, is the thing that's tearing us apart politically and socially. Um, but we also see the same kind of distinction between what we thought was happening um, when we look at the scholarly literature. Uh, this is a, a graph showing that in a set of disciplines, the number of papers with the title, with interdisciplinary in the title has been steadily going up with some significant rises again in that same time period from about 1980, 1990 onwards. Whereas in actual practice, analyses of how interdisciplinary the research really is shows that we're largely talking out of our hats. We talk a lot about interdisciplinary work, we talk a lot about communication. There's not so much evidence that the disciplines that we work in have actually changed over some of those same time periods. And again, I'm going very broad brush over a very complicated story of complicated literature, to largely to make a rhetorical point. Um, and that leads us to places like this. Um, I spend a lot of my time in the UK, and the UK is not really a pleasant place to be a scholar at the moment. Um, this is not just something we laugh at when politicians say that society is sick of experts. This is something we are actually truly grappling with in terms of the gap between the policy debate, whether it's about Brexit or whether it's about the Barrier Reef or about climate change mitigation. These are all things where the gap between what we know, what has been generated by centuries of scholarly work, and what we are able to do in the political sphere, and I use the term we advisedly, is growing and growing. That gap is, is a real problem. So part of the question, if we start with this notion that the web was going to bring us all together, was going to improve the quality of discourse, was going to create a space in which evidence and discussion and critical thought could be brought together in new and exciting ways, we wouldn't be limited by geography. What went wrong? 
um, what was it that we missed or didn't understand? Um, and this is kind of personal, because this was something, this was a story I was peddling um, in a very particular way. The, the title of this talk recalls a talk I gave almost exactly five years ago in Berlin um, in the context of a conference about open source uh, technologies and bioinformatics, where I was arguing that these networks, that these, these systems and mechanisms of communication, platforms and infrastructures and technologies of communication, um, were radically changing the way we were operating. Um, and part of the argument was, you know, we can understand different systems. These are both networks. The fact that one is a network of gene control in a bacteria and the other is a social network in a colony of ants doesn't necessarily matter because we can understand them from the abstraction, through the abstraction, through the lens of understanding networks themselves. And those networks have changed the way we operate. And this isn't something that developed purely from the web. This is a picture of the internet circa 1977. Probably many of you have seen this diagram and, and diagrams like it. And this network, at this stage relatively small, changed the politics and economics of the world. Um, in, its, in, its, in its ultimate form. But, go back another hundred years, and another network radically changed the politics and economics and social structures of the time. This is telegraphs, undersea telegraphs, connecting the world up so that for the first time, a cricket match being held at Lords could be transmitted in more or less real time to people in Sydney. That it was always talked about in terms of sport, and in this country it's always been talked about in terms of cricket, and always in terms of games against the English team. Um, but those things lead to the speed of communication, the rate of communication, the, the, the ability to identify what the price of wheat is in London before you start putting it on a ship in Sydney changed the underlying economics of the world in very significant ways. We can go back another hundred years. These are not actually rivers in France. These are stagecoach routes. And again, the density and interconnection of information was a significant contributory factor to the various revolutions happening in 17th and 18th century France. The politics changes, the social structures change, the economics change. So my argument five years ago, 10 years ago, um, was that all of these are networks. What can we understand by thinking of them as networks? What happens when we really truly um, abstract and this slide is not going to work because it's a video um, and I can show it to people afterwards. But it's a very simple simulation of what's called a percolation network. Um, and the way it works is you basically um, take a grid and you give every box on that grid a random number between 0 and 1. And as you raise, and then you see for a given threshold, say 0 0.1, if a box has a value that is more than 0 0.1, less than 0 0.1, you light it up, you turn it from 0 to 1, in this case from, from blue to red. And then you see whether there's another coloured box next to it. So you look at how the different points on the grid are connected with each other. And what you can do with this kind of simulation, it's a random simulation, is look at how many different clusters are formed, how big they are, what is the characteristics of the interconnection between them. And one of the things that emerges from that is despite the fact you randomise that grid, so the structure of the network you're creating is different every time, the characteristics of the network as you run the simulation, on average, are always the same. And in particular, something that happens is that the interconnectivity of the network goes through a critical change, it actually goes through a phase change um, in chemical or, or physical science terms. And that's where all the interesting stuff happens, where you go from people being mostly disconnected to mostly connected. This happens predictably, it happens in ways that you can understand from a, from a purely mathematical perspective. 
So again, not that the world is built on a square grid and we're connected up in simple ways, but that through this lens of understanding and a network, in, a, in an abstract term, we can predict how the world will work. And some things that emerge from that is the better connected the network, the more interconnections, the more dense they are, the more valuable it is. So this is Metcalfe's law um, of, of network systems. But this was sort of then led me to the core of my argument, which was if we are trying to communicate knowledge, if we're trying to communicate claims and ideas, and we're interested in interacting with people to do that, then the probability of getting assistance from someone else, the probability of having someone contribute to the solution to your problem, is related to three things. First, there's a, there's a question of, of interest. How many people have the capacity, the knowledge, the skills to actually contribute? Second factor is how hard is it for them to contribute? So in a sense, how many are there and how easy is it for them to contribute are the key, are the key factors. And then the question of how many people you can reach. You're moving from a world where that, that question is answered by how many people are in my department to how many people can I connect to on the internet. Those numbers change radically. Um, and it's, but one thing doesn't change necessarily at first order. And that's the, the, the number of people who actually have a capacity to contribute. What changes is two things. How hard is it for them to engage? It's suddenly much easier because we're doing this online, because we're connected up. Again, you remember back, or those of us who are old enough to remember, the days when if you were visiting a city, you actually had to organise in advance if you wanted to meet with people. You didn't, for instance, send an email the day before and just say, oh, I'm on campus, who's around? Because you would have had to send a letter or make a phone call, connect up all of those people. It was a lot harder. And of course, the other thing is that we're connected to much larger numbers of people. So that multiplier effect is very strong. And so the argument I was making as an open access advocate, as an open knowledge advocate at the time, was all of the processes that we put under the name of open build bigger networks. They make more connections, they make it easier to connect, they connect you to more people, and that is necessarily good. So the bigger the network, the better. And that was fundamentally the argument of the techno-utopians, the Silicon Valley folks, who were building the web technologies, the internet technologies. And indeed, the open knowledge advocates, um, what I often ended up calling the commonsists. It's this really strange mixture of people who are actually still very keen on markets, on a, on a, on a sense of a capitalist analysis of a knowledge economy, but at the same time had this view that somehow we were going to transmute that into a communitarian process with commonly held goods. And again, if that was true, then some of the hundreds of billions of dollars that's sitting in the accounts of Sergey Brin would have been distributed amongst the rest of us. We wouldn't have the same levels of inequality that we have in that information world at the moment. And one of the things that we missed, or didn't miss, or didn't interrogate properly was the notion we were going from this the centralized model with authorities in control of the distribution of information and physical constraints on the movement of that information to this beautiful federated and distributed world where everything was good and everyone was equal and failing to recognize that a this never happens in practice because power exists but more important that this kind of small worlds network model is actually more important. The argument I was making five years ago was bigger, better, flatter networks. More equality overall was good. What we were missing was that actually the group scale, the community scale, matters. And that's really kind of, actually at some point I could just stop there, right? You can see people nod along and say, oh yeah, now I get that, now I understand how it all works, what went wrong. There's just those stupid scientists and technologists who didn't really understand the, 
the, the importance of community and, and, and critical analysis, right? That's, that's, that's the kind of <laughs> response I'm getting. So I want to go a little bit further than that. Um, it won't surprise you know, in this context, working with folks like John and Lucy, that you know, we're concerned about groups and why groups are important in this way, understanding what groups are doing matters. So I need to take a side step at this point talk a little bit about knowledge and groups and scaling um, to then sort of make, make much further progress on this. Because that's what we're really about here, it's about systems and networks that create and distribute knowledge. So I have two assertions. They're relatively non-controversial though. We can argue about the, the, the detail points. Okay, so the first of those is that knowledge grows, particular knowledge production grows. Appreciate those are not quite the same thing. Um, but from a first approximation, we can look at a range of proxies and go back to the solar price um, in the 60s, looking at the scale um, of the scientific literature and showing that over a very long time period, this is from 1900 to 1960, that actually a lot of these data could be pushed back into the 18th century, that you see a more or less straightforward exponential growth um, over the very long term in the growth of the productivity of scientific outputs in this case. Um, there are lots of disagreements with this and issues around the data and all sorts of other things going on, but, but the pattern holds. Um, we can look at the amount of digital data. This is some data held in um, US national um, archives at the National Library of Medicine in various kinds of forms. And again, exponential growth um, showing no real sign of, of decaying or slowing down, um, even though the funding and you can also look at the human capital over time. This is a graph of the number of people um, in undergraduate university education globally um, across most of the 20th century. At a grand, broadly speaking, that's an exponential growth curve. Um, and it hasn't particularly slowed down um, over the last 10 or 20 years. So wherever we look, whenever we look at these proxies of knowledge production, the scale of the community, the scale of the funding, the scale of the number of people, and the amount of stuff coming out. All of these things grow, and they have grown over an extraordinarily long period of time. There isn't a country in the OECD that does not have a university in it that predates the nation state in which it exists. Those are very, very long-lived institutions. Um, the only thing that wins over universities is the Catholic Church. So second assertion, knowledge is made by groups. And it kind of doesn't matter at one level what kind of detailed model um, put here. The assertion is, is, is strong enough on its own. Um, but I want to dig a little bit more de deeply than that because it, it helps um, unpick the argument. So there are plenty of social models of knowledge production, and, and a lot of them have something in common. This is a model um, which is very old, um, from Ludwig Fleck, writing in German in the 30s, but only translated into English. Um, in the 80s. And his sort of overall model of what's going on is that what he calls the esoteric group, the specialists, the experts, I think of them as the research group themselves, circulates ideas and claims, but at some point the process of actually making knowledge involves circulating that out of the group into the exoteric, the broader community, the great unwashed, the public, if you like, so that that process of dissemination, of translation across the group boundaries is a critical part of the process. Um, Jerry Ravitz, um, in Scientific Knowledge and its Social Problems, makes very sim similar claims, but he suggests something a little bit more complicated, because I don't want to privilege that esoteric group, which is a problem in, in flex models. So if we just think of, of two communities, um, and again, they're circulating claims and ideas between them, between these two groups, then the process of translating across the boundaries and the absorption of those ideas in some form by another group, and these are, in Starr's terms, formally boundary objects, almost by definition, because they can't possibly be understood in complete form by the two, the two, the two non-cognate groups. Jerome Rabbits makes a really interesting observation um, in his book, uh, which is then from the 70s, 
which is that it's not just a process of translating this across one from one discipline. He's thinking about disciplines and research groups to others. It's not a question just of having that idea absorbed by the next door discipline or the next group. It's actually also a process of it then being reabsorbed. Um, many of you know that I'm a little bit obsessed by reading into the, the writings of Robert Boyle. Um, and one of Ravitz's points that he makes is that Boyle would not have understood the law, which if you've done high school chemistry, you would have heard described as Boyle's law. He wouldn't have understood it. He didn't have the mental machinery. The chemists at the time didn't have a way of understanding what it was that he had in fact discovered. It was translated across into a broader group and then the chemistry community absorbed it back as an abstraction, as a story we tell about how matter works. So it's not just translation out, it's translation back in. That um, places knowledge, production, generation, abstraction as a question of translation. And of course, again, this is John's fault for those of you who have been in this group matches very neatly onto Yuri Lotman's discussion of the process of translation or reception of ideas, including that retransmission and reacceptance by the originating group. And if this doesn't look like the process by which ideas move across disciplinary boundaries, I don't know what does. So, oh, that's a bit ugly. Um, so general knowledge is being produced at the boundaries of groups. And these groups are in contact. In a sense, they have to be in conflict because they can't understand each other. That's almost the underlying definition of a group here. They have different cultures, they have different stories, framings and ways of working through things. So they are necessarily going to be in some form of, of conflict if they're in contact. Okay, so this leads us to a problem. We go back to these two assertions. First, that knowledge grows. Second, knowledge is made by groups. There's a fundamental problem here. If knowledge production is scaling up and groups are at the core of knowledge production, because groups don't scale. Every single strand of disciplinary thought about communities and groups and learning and politics and management and business tells us that groups in and of themselves cannot arbitrarily scale up. Um, so this model is inherently broken um, because groups don't scale. Two things can happen when you try and scale up a group. Either the group gets bigger over time, and at some point it, 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 it inevitably fractures. I will point at no political parties trying to resolve the differences in Canberra today. Um, but it's actually quite a nice example of of exactly that process. The group no longer has the coherence to hold itself together. The other option is that you keep the groups the size that they work at and make more of them, but then you run into a coordination problem because those groups have been actually suffering much the same problem, that they split apart and don't understand each other. So, and the truth is of course that what actually happens in the real world is a mixture of these two things hitting you head along at different stages, right when you don't need it, and don't expect it. But, I showed you those graphs, knowledge production is growing, has grown, has continued to grow, it looks really, really smooth over the long term. So what's going on? Um, this is a different graph of much the same thing, this is publications in, in PubMed over time, it's in medical sciences, some interesting things going on, but the only thing that really causes a dip in that overall growth, there's some Stories to be told about what's really going on here. It's not quite as big a jump as it looks. Um, the only two times, or the only times you see actual drops in that growth, that's the Second World War, that's the First World War. Um, ooh, what's that? Civil War. Civil War, amongst other things, but yeah. Um, it's also, we're starting to get into the Crimea and the Boer War here as well. Do they come a little later? In what continent? Sorry? In what continent? Do you yes. So, these, and so this is medical research um, as a whole. And, and, and yeah, actually primarily there's a bias in the early um, records here, obviously, to the US, because this is PubMed. This is, again, the National Library of Medicine, um, the US National Institutes 
So something's happening, right? So something is enabling these groups to grow and scale and work over time. Um, we understand the systems and platforms that enable this kind of scaling to occur. Um, we do have large organisations. They do kind of work sometimes. And they work because of the development of culture and institutions, and institutions in the broad political economy sense, that support that scaling process. So the question of how knowledge production, Western knowledge production, has managed over, over the long term is one of culture and institutions. What institutions have been brought into play help? And again, I go back to the university as a long-lived institution in the organisational sense, a long-lived organisation, is also clearly an institutional form in the political economy sense. It's part of that story. Um, but any single institutional cultural form is going to have limits to scale. So we have a prediction. This is a now a generative model that's come out of two assertions um, about things breaking in a particular kind of way, which is that you have a growth process. It will hit some kind of intrinsic limit based on the capacities of the culture and institution in play to enable growth. There will be a process of either death, I mean, there's, there's possible here of just falling off and dying, obviously. Um, since that hasn't happened, there's some sort of process of innovation in political terms, economic terms, social terms, or technological terms that allows us to go into the next phase of growth, but before that you have to have adoption of that. So it's not enough for an innovation to solve a problem. It has to solve a problem and to be adopted, at which point we then go into another phase of growth. But there'll be another intrinsic limit because our institutions are never perfect. There's always a, an end point. Could you just like say what you think about the role of technology in that series of processes? I'll come back to that. It's excellent. <laughs> kind of. Um, so that's yeah. So this is the abstract model. This is the prediction. What is what? What can we actually look at? Um, oh, sorry. Then there are two things that arise out of that that are quite interesting. One is that these things are endogenous. If the system is sustainable, if the system of Western knowledge production is sustainable. That means those innovation institutions need to be generated internally, they're endogenous. That's important for how we think about this from an economic theory perspective. Um, but it's also quite interesting in the way that as scholars, we often complain about the world doing things to us, rather than thinking about whether those are things we actually caused through our own actions. And the other point is that there will always be a next crisis. So again, someone like me five years ago saying, if we could just solve scholarly communications, just make open access work, just make it affordable, just make everyone included, then we will have solved all the problems. Bollocks. <laughs> We're just setting ourselves up for the next problem, which we haven't yet quite imagined what it will look like. What does that sound like in concrete terms? Okay, 20th century or the late 20th century, in scholarly communications, a part of history. Um, again, skipping over a lot of detail. Post Second World War, massive global invention in investment in scholarship, in particularly in sciences. Um, you get to about 1950, and the scholarly communication system, particularly the journal system, is about to collapse. We have a bunch of small societies who are used to publishing small local journals who cannot deal with the volume of articles being sent to them. They physically cannot print the copies and get them distributed to the number of people who want to subscribe. The system is, and this is on the 200 years of scholarly communication and publishing as a loss-making business. So the losses are spiralling out of control. The systems and technology cannot cope. And into the breach steps Robert Maxwell, oddly enough with a lot of money from the British government. There's a political angle to this as well. But he brings a whole bunch of interesting and revolutionary concepts. One is that you can turn this into a thing that actually makes money, so that as it scales up, there's more money made. That's new in the 1950s, right? It hasn't happened in the entire history of publishing, scholarly publishing prior to that. But he also recognises that what he can do is make the scale up by creating journals and creating disciplines that gather around journals. So he spots the new up-and-coming scholar or the well-established scholar he buys them extremely expensive meals and persuades them that they want to be the leader 
in this field, and this new field needs a new journal, and that they are the person to take that on. And what that means is you can radically expand the number of journals, which solves the problem of the incoming volume. And then he brings his experience in, in industry, and in the industry, in fact, of, of logistics um, during the war, to the problem of how you scale up industrialised distribution, print distribution at this point, um, and, and distribution, which is why he ends up in newspapers ultimately, because he then translates from what he learns in scaling up and industrialising scholarly publishing to then move into to news publishing. This causes a second problem, the problem I've talked about before. As you start creating more and more disciplines and more and more journals, literature gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So where does it stop? How do you know what is scholarly? How do you know what counts as being a proper scholarly publication? And this becomes a serious problem in around about the late 60s, early 70s. And so we have to invent a social technology, a socially shared concept that defines the boundaries of the scholarly publishing world. Um, sorry, industrialization. <coughs> and that's peer review. So I'm not going to belabor this because I think I've belabored it in the past, but peer review as a concept, as something that defines the boundaries of the scholarly literature, <coughs> is an invention of the early 1970s. Prior to that, you knew what was a scholarly literature because you knew the the good chaps who were involved in it. And they, you, know, you probably could have known them personally. So then that allows everything to scale up more. More disciplines, more silos, more journals. Anyone know where this quote comes from? Mm. It's in Tim Berners-Lee's original proposal for the World Wide Web. And what's interesting about this is that Tim is basically proposing a technical detailed fix on hypertext. Hypertext has existed for 60 years beforehand. But everyone writing about hypertext talks about linking documents. Tim is talking about linking knowledge across silos. This is an endogenous technological innovation that arises with the intent of solving the economic coordination problem across the silos that are growing of scholarly disciplines. And that's precisely what Tim was setting out to do. So, and this is the experience most of us <coughs> have actually spent our entire scholarly lives in the crisis and the response of trying to figure out how on earth we apply digital technologies in the web to research communication. Um, this starts in the 90s when I started my PhD, and it hasn't been resolved yet. But if we imagine the next problem, what's the next problem? We solve the problem of access, we solve the problem of distribution, we solve the problem of discovery. So if there is a piece of scholarly information out there, you know you have access to it, and you know you can find it. We we'll propose that the next problem, to which we would expect people to already be proposing solutions, is the one of whether I can use it. Can I incorporate this information? Can I trust it? And so we might expect to see, in disciplines that are moving fast, issues to deal with trust, the whole reproducibility crisis in the sciences, social solutions, such as pre-registration in psychological sciences that are dealing with a whole area of whether they can actually trust the results coming from any of the most famous labs, partly because of a crisis of fraud, but part of this complicated question. And we'd expect people to be proposing technological solutions that solve this problem. Blockchain. Whether they solve the problem is a question not just of whether the technology can do it, but also a question of adoption. And so we can start providing, using some critical analysis to ask the question, what is the structure of a solution that would solve this problem? What would that look like? How would, how would it change? Something else arises out of this, and going back to that notion of, of knowledge coming out of translation, first, is diversity is the first order principle. If you can translate what you're doing across bigger and bigger boundaries to more and more diverse groups, and you are creating more and more general, and I know there's a whole bunch of philosophical problems underpinning that statement, um, knowledge creation, at least, at least at first order. Um, 
but so is community, so is identity, because you can't have the diversity amongst groups unless those groups have definition. And that means that locality, and therefore exclusion, the door of this room is closed. Anyone could have walked in off the street, but they won't, because a certain group of people know about it. A certain, so there's a whole processes of exclusion and inclusion going on all the time in the creation of any of these groups, and that's part of the process of defining what we might come to as a consensus and how that might be translated across to a different group. And we also have that internally. And so another way of looking at this is that actually we have processes of opening up, the, the opening up of scholarly communication. We tell the story of Maxwell as though it's a horror story today because of what it led to, but it actually enabled the globalisation of scholarly production. Um, it, was, it was, in many ways, in its original form, a, a pure public good. But then peer review had to come along and close that back down. We had to define the boundaries. The web, I think we can certainly say something about opening up. But when it comes to questions of authority and trust, whether it's in politics or in scholarship, I think there's a strong argument that actually what we'll be doing will be more filtering, more closing down, more defining the boundaries of who gets to say what, or what gets to say what, as the case may be. So it's not just about bigger networks. It's about the right local structure that provides coherence and identity and culture um, and sustainability to enable those broader interactions to take place. Um, and so if we think about what these institutions have to do, a lot of what they have to do is to create productive boundaries. Our institutions need to support the formation of groups but also the formation of boundaries, but also the formation of boundaries in such a way that those interactions are productive and useful. Um, they have to be productive conflict. Again, borrowing from John's and Jason Potts' concept of staged conflict. A lot of what we're doing in our work is actually bringing ideas into opposition, creating conflict, which has very strong explicit and implicit rules about the way we do it. John gets to interject in my talk because he's a senior person. Most of you won't. But you'll ask questions at the end, perhaps. There are rules. There is a set form of what's going on in, in this room. Um, another, the, perhaps the clearest example of that is peer review in its current modern form, where everyone looks at this and laughs, right? Because it's both the thing we don't want to admit is our way of looking at it, there's also our experience of it. We hate peer review, but we think it's really important. Um, and what it really is, is a very strongly staged form of conflict between one group of authors and another group of referees who are looking for problems, looking for gaps, looking for ways to improve or change it, adjudicated by rules of referees. And what's really interesting about peer review, and again, going back to it as a social form that we use to unify the academy, is it's not one thing. Peer review is a very different thing in different disciplines. But we have to call it the same thing so that we have something in common. Our identity as scholars is very, very strongly tied to the idea of peer review, to the extent that whenever I say it's invented in 1970, there's always, and there was, an intake of breath. Come on. Peer review's been around forever, hasn't it? It must have been. Except it wasn't. That's actually threatening our identity. It's a really uncomfortable thing to come to terms with. Yet at the same time, if you try and move your experience of peer review and expect it to play out the same way if you went into the sciences or into medicine or into engineering or maths, you'd be horrified <laughs> by what is entirely different and therefore wrong about how it's done. So, trying to wrap this up and again take us a slightly different angle. I've, I've been struggling for quite some time to try and figure out a way of framing this question. How do, it's one thing to say local structure matters, but how do we then get into it? How do we figure out where to look for it, what to, what to understand? And then how can we translate that into, into our, our current understanding? And this model 
is both a framework which I think can help support that, at least get us away in thinking it, but it's also an example of the problem in its own right. So has anyone anyone ever seen this before? Look. Sign tried? Sorry? Is it a sign tried? No, close. So it's it's a thing called um, the Sabato Triangle. Um, published in a working paper in Uruguay, in Spanish, in 1968. It's never been translated into English. I only came across this, like, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, and it's an interesting model of the role of knowledge production in development. Um, it sort of, it, if, for those of you in this kind of space, it sort of prefigures um, the triple helix model um, of innovation, um, and so you might think we might actually expand this into the sort of quadruple helix and include civil society as one of the perversives, but for the purpose of the argument, it doesn't actually matter very much. The point that Sabato and Batan make, which is really quite striking, and there is the context of development, is that it doesn't matter how strong the vertices are. What matters is the balance between the interactions along the edges. If you want to have a national system which is driving development, you need good interactions between the scholarly system, government and regulation, and the economic system, so entrepreneurialism and, and industry. And again, yeah, this is a this is a semi-Marxist model from the from the 60s, so there's a bunch of things being conflated there. Um, but that's a really interesting point in terms of this notion of community and space, that what matters in driving development and knowledge in the service of development is that the interactions around this are equal. And in particular, that one vertex isn't more strongly interacting with an external triangle, such as the so-called international system of scholarship. And of course, what, this is exactly what all of our evaluation systems do. If you've interacted with people from developing and transitional countries, they're being driven entirely by the degree to which their work is being cited or being included in so-called international journals, by which we mean journals published in North America and Northwestern Europe, dealing with concerns of North America and Northwestern Europe. And so it's probably not a wild surprise that the people in various countries in Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia, who are at this vertex of the triangle, being funded often to drive knowledge production and development in these countries, are actually not well integrated with government, not well integrated with local industry, because they're driven by an obsession to interact with the global, international, so-called flat network of scholarship represented by what makes it into web of science. And, in fact, you often actually also see this from the other vertices of the triangle as well, in terms of the concerns of whether there is, in fact, local industry, whether it's a product of, of um, parts of, of, of multinational corporations, and, well, the less said about the co-option of government by international interests, the better, probably. So, from my perspective, looking at this um, from, you know, where we are, getting on to the second quarter of the 21st century, um, we can make this more sophisticated and start to think about the networks. And we've got the data on this, right? So social media networks, connectivity, citation networks, we can, and financial flows. We can start to pick apart what this looks like. Um, and think about what are the institutions that will support localization and locality? What are the things that will encourage the knowledge producers in a given country to actually interact productively with government and with local industry, rather than our current obsessions with interacting with the network of one particular form of exchange of citations in one particular form of system, like the scientific journals, say largely published in North America and Northwestern Europe. So locality matters. And indeed, thinking about how we build our evaluation centre systems so that they actually register these interactions. You know, in this country, we're starting to get some credit. Well, this university, everyone running around trying to demonstrate we're doing demand-driven research and complaining about it. 
that's, a, that's an effort to try and strengthen some of these interactions. That our interactions with policymakers, God forbid, um, in, in this country you know, are, are starting to be tracked in things like impact assessment. Those things are starting to try and balance out our attention to these different parts. And it's not just about citations. I mean, this map could be a map of pretty much anything. It could be a map of financial flows. It could be a map of undersea network cables. It could be um, a map of citations. It happens to be um, a map of airline routes. And what you see in all of these maps is post-colonial countries tied to their colonial masters and a centre periphery system in which control, power and prestige is arrogated. Again, North America and Northwestern Europe with China and Japan starting to appear now as another, as another pole in a slightly more of a centric world. If you do look at citations, you can see exactly the same thing. The patterns, they're tied back to colonial history. Um, Sometimes through language, but not exclusively through through shared language. Um, the scholarly literature is in the language of the colonisers, um, not in the language of the colonised. Um, and challenging this by thinking about locality, thinking about privileging the local interactions, and perhaps rejecting the notion of the international, where international, as I say, and I know I keep punching this point, but international is code for North Atlantic. Issues of international health interest are the issues of wealthy, mostly white men, things like heart disease and diabetes. They're not things like road traffic deaths, diarrhea, and respiratory tract infections. You work on those things, you're not going to get into the Lancet. The Lancet is not a global journal. It's an international journal, but it's not a global journal. And one suggestion I have is fundamentally, if you can't replace the word international with global, then perhaps don't use it at all. And think about more about where the power, the structural power is coming from that makes that um, international place. And then, so the, the point is, I don't know which all the slides go in now, that building the right networks is the important thing. I mean, maybe that's not saying very much at all, maybe it's just going back to, to the obvious, that building connection and being purposeful and thoughtful about connection matters. Um, I think what's perhaps useful to think about is this requires, if these are institutions we're talking about, we have to institutionalise locality. Because the trend is always to the global, it's always to capital, it's always to power. The trend will always be to the status quo. And so if we want to make progress in building the right local networks that build the communities that make knowledge production more equitable, then we need to institutionalise and privilege local interactions in a way which is the opposite of what we've been doing over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, that drives in a development context to privileging perhaps the national, perhaps the regional. There's some interesting questions there. Um, but I think it's also um, in our own context, you know, worth considering about some of the, the, the positive results that come from thinking this way. This is a quote I discovered looking at Kim Scott's work. This is from something he wrote about the Wheel Omen project um, in the Griffith Review a couple of years ago. And so the point here is that entire project of taking a Western archive of recordings of indigenous stories and starting as the first principle to give it back to the successes of the indigenous populations that provided them, of privileging the local interaction and being thoughtful first about consolidating and enhancing the local culture and ensuring its longer term survival. And second, thinking about how that group then interacts and translates that 
for the benefit of wider organisations, wider communities, and wider groups, um, is a powerful example of, if not necessarily deliberately thought about at the beginning in these terms, but definitely deliberately thought about in the project, that this is a model for thinking, and that in all of these cases it's going to be the encounters between Indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge where we find the greatest tests um, of, these, of these problems and our ability to build equitable systems to manage them. So I'll stop with that quote, I'll finish that. And, um...